Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, and uh, um, I want to extend a welcome to Natalia Serna, who's here with us um, today uh, to talk about her, her work um, on the US-Mexico border and to play some music for us as well. So the way this is gonna work, um, so we're gonna have about 45 minutes of, of this, of her presentation, and then about 15 minutes of Q&A. Um, and so in the interest of being able to sort of maximize that time, I'm really just gonna turn it right over to you, Natalia, and allow you to do your sort of introductions and, um, and everything. And folks, um, if you have, when it comes to Q&A, um, you're welcome to turn your mic on and just ask your questions or um, put your questions in the chat um, and I can read them or um, I guess those are the two options or raise your hand as well um, and, and, and to ask the question. So, um, so welcome Natalia, thank you. Um, well, first of all, thank you all for, for spending this time with me, and thank you, Anna, for inviting me. I'm going to, uh, as Anna said, I'm going to talk a lot about the U.S.-Mexico border, about the work I did there for years, and then I'm also going to talk a little bit about myself and how I ended up on the border. Um, so, for starters, my name is Natalia Serna. I am Colombian American. My dad's from a very small town in Colombia and my mom is from a very small town in Ohio. And um, they made up and I was lucky enough to grow up in Colombia till I was about 15. Uh, I'm actually born in Virginia, never lived there, um, <laughs> but grew up in Colombia. And when we turned, when I turned about 15, if for any of you that have been studying maybe a little bit of Latin America, you know that Colombia's had a civil war for about 50 years. Um, and uh, I think my mom really just became tired of living in, in the insecurity and it just became hard. A lot of Colombians left Colombia in the 90s and my family was one of those families. Uh, and we moved to Chicago. Well, I thought we were moving to Chicago, but we were really moving to a suburb of Chicago. <laughs> um, I went to Chicago and uh, just about high school, I decided to go to the University of Illinois in the city. And I wasn't, I really wasn't sure what I wanted to study. It wasn't very clear to me. I had low expectations of college, I would say, but you know, it, it was what you had to do at the moment. So I moved to the South side of Chicago. And I think that that's kind of where I woke up a bit. I moved into Pilsen. Pilsen is the beginning of the south side of Chicago, and it is like a really rich and vibrant Mexican community. So if any of you have Mexican friends, you know that Mexicans are a strong nationalist. They have a really like a strong sense of their national identity. And Pilsen was one of these neighborhoods that was just like alive. I mean, you could eat a mango on the street, play soccer, listen to Mexican music. And there was just this energy in the street. Um, and then, you know, I was, you know, a college student like anybody else until 2006 came. And, you know, for the students here, y'all are too, too young to remember this, but 2006 was a big year for Latinos in the U.S. It was a big year. And on March 10th, of 2006, about 100,000 people walked out into the streets over something called HR 4437. Uh, this bill would not only make anybody undocumented a criminal, it would also make anybody that helped folks that were undocumented criminals. Uh, priests, doctors, people that are marrying people, people that are burying people. And there was a sense in the air that something was happening in the US and it was not good. You know, And, and the Latino community started to mobilize the March 10th um, march in Chicago mobilized 200 other cities to do marches. And this ended in LA, LA on May Day, where some people estimate over a million people came out onto the streets. And this was all over this fear that started to ripple through the Latino community about what was going on in the US with immigration and the police. And I don't, I don't think any of us really knew what was going on, but we knew that the police was starting to do immigration raids. The police was starting to work with immigration and, and people, were, people were afraid. Uh, after the March 6th 
I moved to Portland, Oregon. I found work. I was lucky to find work. People said that there was no work to be found in Portland, highest unemployment rate in the nation. But I got work at a public school and I watched a documentary in a film. The documentary I very much recommend to you guys, if you're interested on the border, it's called Dying to Live by Daniel Grudy. Father Grudy is a priest and professor at Notre Dame that was really interested in the US-Mexico border and the death toll that was happening in the US-Mexico border and the difficulties. Uh, and that really, this movie, it captivated me. It made me start to wonder what was going on in the border. And I was a person that I've always lived between borders, but I was not that familiar with with the stories of Mexicans in the US, you know? But this, this, this documentary made me, made me interested in understanding the border. And then I watched another movie that's amazing and I totally recommend to anybody. And it's called eh, Sin Nombre. Sin Nombre is a film done by Cari Fukunaga and Gael Garcia. And it follows the story of a young Guatemalan girl. This is a very like Hollywood film, you know? Uh, well made. It's a story of a young Guatemalan girl who is trying to get to the U.S. to unite with her mom and in the south of Mexico she meets this Mexican gangster that basically helps her get to the U.S. through these freight trains. Um, and so that really got me interested in, in this experience that Central Americans have crossing Mexico. Um, I think probably most of you have heard of La Bestia or the Beast and how a lot of Central Americans use the train in order to get to the US. So these two experiences really like got me, got me interested on the US-Mexico border and ending my year at uh, Portland, I came down to the border and I was a volunteer with a group called No More Deaths. And I'm gonna try and share my screen with you so you can see the map and we can kind of, um, so we can see the map. So let's see if I can share my screen. Compartir pantalla. Let's see. And here we go. Okay. Hopefully you guys are seeing my screen. Good. Yes. Great. Let's see. So this is me and here we have our map. Okay. So if you can see the map with me, we have uh, on one side of the map, we have Tucson, right? It's just west of El Paso and just south of Tucson, there's a small city called Nogales. Nogales is one of these many cities on the border that's literally been cut in half by the border. So half of the city is in the US, the other half is in Mexico. And of course, before the border existed, people came back and forth, you know, on a daily basis. In Tucson, there is a really interesting group called uh, No More Deaths. So when I saw Daniel Grudy's film, I said, Father, I'm, I'm really interested in the border. Could you tell me what can I do to learn more about this? And he said, Natalia, you should go down and visit No More Deaths. No More Deaths is a, a small, well, not so small anymore. It's an organization that gives humanitarian relief to folks on the border. Back in 2008, when I came down to the border, they had this camp in the middle of the desert. Um, and they're like just literally a bunch of students, anarchist hippies that had set up a camp. And what they would do is that for folks that were stranded, they would provide food, water, medical relief um, to all of these folks that are walking all of this desert. So if you see Nogales, the logic of the US border around the 90s was to expand the border wall. So these cities that didn't really have walls, they built these immense walls and they pushed them into the desert because their logic was like, nobody's gonna try and walk um, through the Sonoran Arizona desert because it's a very hostile land. And of course they were wrong. People did continue walking. And what they did is that many folks uh, before they get to Nogales, you know, they're taking these trains, they're going to go veer left and they're going to start walking. Some folks may walk 10 days all the way to Phoenix. And it's, 
it's remarkable that anybody makes it anyway, because it's very difficult terrain. It's mountainous, it's dry, there is no water, the heat is 120 degrees. And of course, this has pushed up the death toll. So these kids out in the desert, they're really trying to just provide humanitarian relief to all these folks that were getting lost. After I spent a week with them, um, I talked to Don Barletti. Don Barletti is a photographer based in LA that did a beautiful photo series called Enrique's Journey. Uh, Don traveled on these freight trades and followed a young man that was trying to get to LA to his mom. And so I called Don and I said, you know, I really want to know about the experience that these Central American migrants are having. I want to know what, what, what they're experiencing on these freight trains. Why are they taking these freight trains? And he said, well, Natalia, what you should do next is you should go down to Veracruz. If you look down at the map, you should be able to find Mexico City and just on the Gulf, you have Veracruz, right? So the freight trains generally, there are two lines of freight trains. These freight trains start at the south of uh, the country, right with the border with Guatemala. They run up the Pacific Ocean and around the Gulf of Mexico. They meet up in Mexico City and they, and they veer off again. So one of those lines is going to run up the Pacific Coast through what you see is Puerto Vallarta, Mazatlán, Culiacán, Hermosillo. And th that train is going to veer and end up in Tijuana. The other train veers in the other direction and it's going to head towards Texas. Um, and so he said, Natalia, you, it's not very safe, but if you want to learn about this, go to Veracruz, don't go any further south. And so I packed up my, my little guitar <laughs> and my backpack, and uh, I was really ignorant. People think like Latinos, Latinos, they all know each other. It's like, no, I really did not know anything about Mexico. I, I had no clue. But I came down to Hermosillo, which is where I live now, and I found a flight and I got off at Veracruz. And in the port of Veracruz, I started asking folks if they had seen a freight train. And they're like, no. <laughs> the freight train is up in a small town called Orizaba, which is not in our map. So I got my stuff. I, I went up to Orizaba and I started walking around this town. And folks were like, looking at me like I was crazy. Because <laughs> this is one of those places that uh, tourists just don't go to because there's nothing to do there. But I started walking around town trying to find this freight train. And alas, at like, eight, nine o'clock at night, I, I saw a freight train pass and it was full of young guys. And I thought that's, that's where I'm headed. So I followed the freight train, <clears throat> found the station. And when I got there, it must've been late at night. I had my backpack with me and there must've been maybe 40 young men sitting on the side of the tracks. And I was really embarrassed because I really, like, I didn't have anything to offer them. I didn't have any money. I didn't have food. I'm just like, you know, a recent graduate in Mexico. And I kind of just, I remember standing there and they looked at me and they're like, hey, Guarita, white girl, you want to come sing a song for us? And I was like, oh, great. This is my chance to make friends. <laughs> so I, I went over and I sit down with these guys and, you know, I'm singing songs in English and we're chatting. And then they're like, well, where are you going? And I thought, well, um, you know, I'm just traveling. And they said, well, we're traveling too. We're going north. You want to come with us? And I thought, yeah, that'd be great. I'll go with you. <laughs> and I remember there is a small group between this whole group of men. There was four young men from Nicaragua. And of course, one of them was leading them because there's in groups generally, migrants generally travel in small groups. And there's generally somebody in the group that's already done this a couple of times. So the guy that was leading them said, okay, I'll get her, you take her guitar and you're going to take her, uh, her backpack and I'm going to make sure she gets on the train. And I was like, okay, that sounds like a plan. And so I was like, oh, what time does the, does the train leave? And he said, well, we don't know, we're waiting. And I thought, oh, great. <laughs> and so kind of just like in the movies that the train started moving and these 40 men started running after the train and one of them had my guitar and the other one had my backpack with my passport. And so I was like, I gotta keep running too. 
And I remember just like running on the side of this freight train and all these guys on the train, they're like, come on, Guarita, let's go white girl. You can do it. You're going to travel with us. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? And somehow between their help and their enthusiasm, I got on that train. And I like to, I like to begin with this story because for me, what captured my interest in migration was this sense of solidarity that people have for each other. I mean, these guys, they didn't know me. Uh, I wasn't family to them. I had nothing to offer and they had no problem with just making me part of their journey. And we spent about three years traveling, three years, three days traveling. That train went into Mexico City and then it went all the way up to San Luis Potosí, which is slightly more north. Um, after that, I, I got off the train and, you know, there are things that you, there are moments in life you experience where you know that you're just never gonna be the same again. You're like, life is just not gonna be the same. And I think I did not know what to make of that experience, but I knew that something was gonna change in my life. And this experience that I had had of this fraternity, this solidarity, the sense that you really do belong to a human family. How do you become family to somebody overnight? I mean, these people took care of me for three days for nothing. I think that really, that really captured me. After, after that experience, I spent some years in South America playing music, but at some point I really, I had this longing to move back to the border uh, I had this sense that there was something I think missing and, and I understood that that was a place I needed to move to. So I called an organization called Kino. Uh, they're an organization that's in Nogales, Sonora and Arizona. They're a kind of a both borders organization and they run a small soup kitchen. Back then it was a small soup kitchen. Now it's big, but they run this small soup kitchen and out of the soup kitchen, they were doing everything for people. They were just medical aid, legal aid, food. Um, and I knew that I wanted to be an organization that was doing work on the ground. So I called them and I said, you know, um, I speak Spanish and I would like to help. Could you, could you use me? And they said, we need somebody to make phone calls and serve tortillas. And I thought, great, I'm super qualified for that. And so I moved to Nogales uh, to the Kino Border Initiative and I spent three years there, just about three years. Uh, and much of what the songs and the stories I'm going to share with you today really correspond to a moment of American history that was very strong 10 years ago. And I think uh, it's the hardest and one of the darkest periods of US history that I think has happened in the last hundred years. And I don't think we have really understood the dimensions of what happened. So the first thing that struck me before I, I start talking to you about the stories of the folks I met, I'm gonna, I'm gonna run a couple photos so you guys can see the Kino Border Initiative. So that was our map. That's Ashley at the soup kitchen. <laughs> He had the flu, I remember. His father Ricardo doing mass at the soup kitchen. The Kino Border Initiative is a Catholic organization. Okay. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm going to start uh, with a song. When I um when I moved to the border, I had been writing songs kind of like my whole life, but I think part of what I started writing again is because sometimes there's really, there's no better way to get through the sort of pain that you're seeing all around you. And I started writing songs 
for the people that I met on the border. And I found that for some reason, these songs help them heal the pain that they were going through. Uh, and many of these songs are really sad, but I'm gonna start with a song that's not sad because I think that the spirit of migration is still a spirit of such incredible optimism and resilience. The fact that folks are willing to put themselves through all of this in hopes that their life will be better. Uh, I think that's hopeful. So this song is called Fuego. And uh, one of my favorite things to do while I was living on the border was to go to the shelter once a week and play these songs. And one day the guys at the shelter suggested that I, that I write a new song that was hopeful. And they said that they wanted a song with the words, fire, destiny, God, hope. And I said, sure. Ese norte es mi destino Entre vagones y la luna Como el que busca salvación A veces Entre las noches paso frío Mi pie izquierdo anda empollado A veces no quiero andar más No quiero andar más Un sueño Es el que empuja como el viento Y yo me voy marino adentro A esa frontera o a cruzar Diosito Yo sé que en todo me acompañas Porque a veces te siento lejos Diosito no me dejes más No me dejes más Ego Fuego, oh, oh. yo tengo un fuego por dentro, no lo puedo apagar, no lo quiero apagar. Sueños, sueños, yo tengo un sueño por dentro, no lo puedo apagar, no lo quiero apagar. I'm walking, I'm headed north, that is my destiny between these wagons in the moon, like one who's seeking salvation, Lord. Sometimes, sometimes I'm really cold. Sometimes my feet are full of blisters, Lord. Sometimes I don't wanna walk no more. I don't wanna walk no more. This dream, this dream keeps me walking against the wind. I'm headed north, that is my destiny. That border is what I'm gonna cross. Diosito, Diosito Lord, I know you are always with me. Why do you seem so far away sometimes, Lord? Diosito, don't leave me no more, don't leave me no more. Fuego, fuego, oh, oh. I have this fire inside me. I cannot put it out. I will not put it out. Fuego, these dreams. Fuego, oh, oh. I have these dreams deep inside me. I cannot put it out. I will not put them out. No. I will not put them out. I will not put them out. I cannot put them out, no. Gracias. So let's, what struck me most about the border and hardest was the immense amount of men and women that were being deported and separated from their families. And that might be in part personal because my dad is, is Colombian, but we would come into the soup kitchen and there would be 150, 200 men that were just deported. And you could see them like staring at the sauce and they 
they did not know what to what to make of themselves. They did not know what to make of life anymore. And the first story of a man that really impacted me was this man called Marcos Hernandez. Marcos Hernandez was a man from León, Guanajuato, center of the country that left when he was about 14. And he is these men that left in the 90s as Mexico, rural Mexico mobilized into the US. And uh, I'm sure that you guys in your studies are going to study about what happened with the North American free, free trade agreement and and how the economy started changing that pushed these men that were from agricultural parts uh, made it impossible for them to have a livelihood anymore and brought them into the US. So Hernandez is one of those men and I'm going to play uh, his story for you. Uh, the text is going to be on the screen. I, it's translated as closely as I could translate it to his voice. So I hope you can make sense of it. And then we're going to we're going to listen to the song that I wrote for him called El Deportado because he wanted it to be called The Deported One. This is Marcos Hernández. Este golpe que me dio la vida, no sé qué estaré pagando, pero yo pienso que estoy pagando algo. Es un golpe fuerte para mí. Es un golpe fuerte para mí y pienso que para mi esposa y mis hijos también. Soy de León, Guanajuato. Yo a mis 14 años crucé el cerro, me fui para Estados Unidos, mi ilusión, hacer mi casa, tener mi familia. Bendito sea Dios, lo he logrado. Tengo mi esposa, mi familia, la tengo en Tren, California, y yo estoy, de, pues estoy deportado acá afuera. Hoy estoy aquí en Nogales, Nogales, Sonora, y, y, y ahora que quiero regresar a, 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 a instalarme con, con mis hijos y mi esposa, la veo un poco dura. Me dijo, me dijo que, que a cuál era mi, mi, mi social security, 
que me salía el número de cuenta que me dije, ¿no? Y ya fue, fue todo lo que me hicieron. Y incluso llegó otro policía, otro policía, y como que yo, yo les entendía lo que estaban, como que me estaban burlando, que se estaban burlando. Pero yo, yo miraba el reloj, miraba el reloj de él, así en, en una patrulla, y yo decía, mis hijos se van a estar asomando por la ventana, por la puerta ahí. Peor mi niña, la más chiquita. En inglés le dije, Sir, I, I, I need to go to the school for, for, for pick up my, my sons. I don't care, me decía, I don't care. Y ya estaba llorando, ya, no, ya después me quedé sin palabras. Y nunca llegué, me quedé esperando, el policía le valió todo, le valió. no lo agradeció a nadie, pero yo pienso que muchos estamos pasando por esto, por esta situación, pero los primeros meses es un infierno vivir eso, la separación de la familia, porque seas como seas, todos te separan y no los vuelves a ver, no los, estás, no los vuelves a ver y los que le iban son los hijos, y más, y más, más los, en mi caso, yo estaba bien en griego, con, con mis cuatro hijos, con, con los cuatro jugaba, con los cuatro peleaba, con los cuatro lo que, todo. Los dos más chicos le eché una mentira, me decían que, que por qué me había venido a México, que por qué no los traje. Le dije, no, no, me dice, no, no puedo, papi, ¿por qué estás en México? Y tu carro, me, me lo traje para México, estoy en México. ¿Por qué eran los diabates? Yo no, no queríamos ir a ver a mi, a mi abuelita, a mi mamá. Le dije, pues ni modo, me dijo, me, me vine de mi trabajo, no puede ir. ¿Cuándo vas a venir? ¿Vas a ver ahora que venga? Te vamos a pegar porque nos queremos ir para México también. Y ya no van. Y el carro te lo llevaste. Mi mamá me lo quería para trabajar. Y el colegio me está en mi casa. Lo dejamos en el, corral, en el corralón. Era un mes, pero pues como no se puede pagar, no se pudo pagar el, el, el corralón a mil, como 1300. No se pudo pagar y lo perdimos. Estaba bien el carro. Ahora, ahora que ustedes quieren contar, les digo, algo ya para allá y se ponen bien contentos. Cuando les digo, algo ya para allá, a lo mejor para la otra semana ya estoy allá con ustedes. Primeramente, Dios, antes de que entren a la escuela, ahorita a lo mejor estoy allá con ustedes. Eh, pues son mentiras, no puedo llegar. Ya tengo, aquí en la frontera ya tengo como tres, cuatro meses. Un dolor que realmente el corazón siente. Porque el corazón llora y el corazón siempre va a estar llorando. Los ojos no tienen su tiempo para llorar los ojos, pero el corazón siempre va a estar llorando por dentro. Tratas de ser fuerte, de suspirar, pero de suspirar va todo el llanto. Es la verdad. Mi sueño. Y ahora, ahora mi sueño pues, es lograr reunirme nomás con mi familia. Eso es todo ahorita en mi, en mi vida. Tratar de, 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 de reunirme con mi familia y, y mis hijos abrazados. Y a mi esposa también. Darle las gracias a papá Charla y a mis hijos igual. Que me muerdan los cachetes, no le hace que me den los corrones, no le hace. Eso es lo que quiero. Es mi sueño ahorita, lograr reunirme con mis hijos. Queremos demostrarles que somos personas, queremos trabajar nomás para sacar adelante la familia. Y si, si nos dieran esa oportunidad, pues qué bien, qué bien. So this song says over and over again, Ahora que hago, si yo ando, deportado, what am I going to do now that I am deported? Ahora que hago, si yo ando, deportado, and the kids, They keep on asking where I went. When is daddy coming home? How am I ever gonna get back, Lord? 
Ahora que hago si yo ando deportado. Could you tell me, God, what I'm paying for so I could just go ahead and pay for it? Did I do something wrong? Did I commit a crime? You gave me four kids, Lord, and I am father to each one of them. So could you tell me, please, what the hell am I doing here? If I cross through the mountains, I'll find La Mafia. If they stop me, I know my life is done. If I get lost or I have no water, or if immigration finds me, but if I don't cross, I'm a coward and a bad dad. There is no humiliation I have not already been through. There is nothing I ain't willing to go through. To see my four kids, Lord, even my life I would give through those mountains. I'm gonna have to cross. Por el cerro voy a tener que cruzar. Por el cerro voy a tener que cruzar. Por el cerro voy a tener que cruzar. So, Mr. Hernandez, um, Mr. Hernandez is one of the thousands and thousands of men who who were deported in those years. And his story is similar to many in the sense, his and both Angelica's, which I'm gonna share with you, are similar in the sense that they're both detained by police officers that work as immigration enforcement. And Mr. Hernandez was detained on a Thursday and by Saturday he was back on the border, basically. And in their attempt to get back, so many of these men, I mean, it's like going through a war zone, you know, they've, they've walked for days through deserts, they've been kidnapped by the mafia, they've been humiliated by US Border Patrol, and they don't know what to tell their kids, because there's really no way to explain to a four year old that you've been deported. And so the children, uh, their logic is my father abandoned me, my father left me and he doesn't care about me. And for them, it's very difficult to speak with their wives because their wives moved to the US 20 years ago, 30 years ago, when it was really not that complicated to cross the border. And so, so many of these men, they'll try four, five, six times. And then as the border becomes, criminalizes more crossing, these men find themselves in prison. So now entry into the US is a crime. And if you're detained, and it could be your first time with illegal entry, you might end up in a Tucson detention center and you'll be there six, seven, eight months. Mr. Hernandez, just in case you're wondering what happened to him, he actually walked for like 10 days and made it to Phoenix and he called me. <laughs> and I hope he made it back to his kids after, after those six months of not seeing them. But it's not the case for most of these dads. Um, this next story, I... I wanna, I wanna share with you is a story of a woman called Angelica Quechol. Um, Angelica is a woman from Puebla. Puebla is a small state in Southern Mexico and she like many folks uh, in the 90s moved to the US as a young woman, 
settled in Phoenix, had two boys uh, born in the U.S. Boys went to school and she had a, a pretty normal, a normal life, you could say. And Angelica worked at uh, the Panda Express and her boys, her oldest boy was in high school. Her youngest one was in secondary school. Uh, and in this morning, Angelica was living in Phoenix in a moment where Phoenix became a really scary place for folks, uh, for immigrants around 2013 when Joe Arpaio came into power. So Joe Arpaio is like a uh, big bad sheriff. Uh, and for some reason he's, he's very popular. And he turned what happened with Hernandez, he did very effectively in Phoenix, which is he turned the local police onto the immigrant community. And so, most folks that were undocumented were terrified. They were terrified of going, sending their kids to school. They were terrified of going to work. They were going, terrified of going to the supermarkets because at any moment they knew that any of these police officers could detain them. And Joe Arpaio uh, he had this idea to build tents in these tent detention centers where he would detain people and then he'd dress men in pink and you know walk them around in chains. So. Phoenix is kind of like, I would call it a circus of horrors. And Angelica is one of these people that walked into the circus because she was going to work, Panda Express, Thursday morning, and she gets to work and she punches in and her coworker who was Cuban turns at her and says, Angelica, you need to get out of here because, because immigration is here. And she looked around the Panda Express and she figured out that she had nowhere to go. So she asked this Cuban man for, for the phone and she calls her husband and she says, "Han," and he says, you don't need to tell me what's going on. I'm seeing it on the news. And so Angelica uh, was in the Panda Express as her son and, and her husbands were looking at this on, on TV and uh, local police showed in with helicopters and guns and they knocked down the door and they handcuffed everybody and they took them into immigration detention. She was working at the Panda Express, I mean. <laughs> so Angelica spent around six months in immigration detention and um, her story, we, we might not listen to here. We'll see how much time, oh my gosh, time flies. Good Lord, my gosh. So uh, we don't have time for Angelica's story, but uh, I interviewed her and her voice is overdubbed by mine. And she speaks a lot about the like emotional pain of being in immigration detention. She was a small, sweet woman that had become Mormon. Uh, and the effects of the immigration detention system really hurt her emotionally and physically. And so that interview really looks at the effects of immigration detention in the US. Um, Angelica spent about six months in detention. She was released. She started going to court and she thought that, that she was gonna be okay. Uh, and one day she shows up at the judge and the judge says, you're going back to Mexico, it's over. And within an hour, she was back on the border and her two sons in the US. And one of the images that I remember so much about Angelica, is she says that the day that she was deported, her son had a goldfish. She had a little goldfish. And you know, of course these tanks have these water purifying systems. She says the water purifying system ate up the goldfish. I don't know how it got sucked into the water purifying system, but I thought it's such a great metaphor for what the justice system does to so many families. I mean, it's a system that's supposed to bring justice, you know, and in the end, and in the end it does not. <laughs> so Angelica, Angelica, I'm not sure what happened with her. I think she tried, she tried to relocate her family back to Puebla because the, the terror of so many of these families is that their children are gonna end up without a guardian and then the state is gonna take their children, which is another thing that happens. It's like single dads, this is really horrifying, single dads living in the US with their kids who have custody of their kids who become deported, children end up in the customs of the government and then try and get your kids back while you've been deported. You'll be called to court and you won't be able to get to court because you're not in the US. So. So Angelica, Angelica's plan was to move her family back to Puebla, but you know, I think so many folks think it's just so easy. Well, why don't you move back? It's like they did everything they could to give their kids what they thought would be a better future. And they're not about to take that away from them so fast. 
And for the dads, they're definitely not going to take that away from that from their kids. If they know that their kids are safe, if they know their kids are going to school, if they know their kids are being fed, and they know in Mexico they've lost everything, have no land, have no work, it's, you know, not that easy. So I wrote this song for Angelica. This song I actually wrote in English. It's, it's, I try to translate these songs. I don't do a great job live, but, but this one is in English. The baby was barely a year old when mama and papa went north. They had big hopes for the little one that he'd become what he dreamed of. The land that they went to was free, a place opportunity. They'd work so hard to give him what he needed to grow up strong. Mama was always working late shifts. Daddy got her to let throws. That boy grew up like all the rest. There was homework at home, there were chores. Sometimes he dreamed of being a doctor. Other times he dreamed of singing songs. The world was wide and open. He couldn't wait to get to the stars. Brothers and sisters, sisters and brothers know. Vamos juntos, all together. Vamos a seguir luchando. Brothers and sisters, I say. Sisters and brothers, all together, vamos juntos, vamos juntos a seguir luchando. Then fear hit the streets like a storm. In mama's voice, there was a shaking, and what she said, she didn't say. They're gonna send me far from you. So you be good to your own papa and tell your brother that I love him. Brothers and sisters, I say, sisters and brothers, vamos juntos, vamos juntos, todos a seguir luchando. Brothers and sisters, I say, sisters and brothers, vamos juntos, vamos juntos, todos a seguir luchando. We're in this together. In this together, Lord, in this together, we are in this, we are in this soul. So, um, oh gosh, I forgot what I was going to say. So we've run out of time. Um, the border today is a much different place. And I think that as this conversation evolves, because it's a living monster, the border. I mean, it changes every day. I think we are no longer talking about migrants. We're talking about refugees. <laughs> and that is a whole other topic um, of conversation. But um, I currently, I moved from the border. I, I came down to Hermosillo and I decided to, to settle somewhere and to believe that the best way to make the world a little bit better was through my own neighborhood. Um, because I think the border really just breaks down your spirit and you just become so, you feel so incredibly impotent to change anything. And then you realize that we really do have an immense amount of power right where we are. <laughs> and so I live in Hermosillo, uh, Sonora, and uh, we receive families that are seeking refugee in Mexico, and most of them are Central American. And then maybe in another day time, we can, we can get into Central American refugees. Um, and I'm going to stop because so we have some time. Thank you so much, Natalia. Um, so I'm ready to open this up to questions from, from the group. Um, as I said before, feel free to put your questions in the chat or, um, uh, or just raise your hand or just turn your mic on that those, those are all fine. Um, your, your questions are welcome. And yeah. I'm just gonna, sorry, yeah. go ahead. I wanted to, you know, as Anna and I were talking about this, I just want to reiterate that, that the border should not make sense to anybody. It's like, it's a changing monster that's here today and it could be gone tomorrow. And, and it, 
So don't feel like if you have a question, it seems like a silly question or you should understand. I don't think even the best lawyers understand the border or understand immigration law. Everybody's really, you know, everybody's just kind of like this trying to figure it out and it's changing every day. So if you have any questions it, it, or please, you know, yeah, ask. <laughs> I'm just going to give a minute for, for folks to, to get their courage up. <laughs> I have a question. Go ahead. So you said the border has changed from since um, when back then. How, like, what's the difference now compared to before? Yeah. As, like, an idea how much it changed? Yeah. So, um... I think the main thing that has changed a lot is that when I moved to the border in 2013, what we were seeing was just like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Mexican men deported daily. And the deportations really, they started under the Bush administration, but they continued throughout the Obama administration. And, and so this, this situation of like Angelica and Marcos, where the police were doing workplace raids, street raids, and and detaining and deporting people, that was the world that I walked into. We were seeing lots of Mexicans deported every day. The, the border today, if you visit Nogales, and if you visit Tijuana, and if you visit Juarez, what you'll see is a lot of Central American families. You know, there's a lot of women with their young children that are looking for refugee status in the US. So I would say that's the main thing that looks different. Um, Physically, the border, to be honest, I don't think it's changed that much. I mean, that huge wall was there before Trump came into power. <laughs> he, you know, he made a lot of noise about it, but it's not new. Uh, and even if they did continue building a wall, it's like, you know, I, I, I don't think structurally that the border has changed, but the migration flow has changed. The number of people, we also see a lot of people, I visit immigration detention here in Mexico, we see people from uh, Ethiopia, the north of Africa, uh, Congo. Uh, so like as there are, you know, movements in other parts of the world, as there's conflict and as there's like the effects of climate change, I think we're seeing more diverse people moving out of their countries and using Mexico to get into the US. And we're definitely seeing a lot of Central Americans trying to leave Central America. Can you talk, oh, there's a, there is something in the chat. Okay, um, Abby Ritz, can thank you so much for speaking to us today. What is your songwriting process like for sharing the stories you learn about? Great question. Yeah, so, um, so when I moved, I had always written songs since I was a kid and I really liked to write songs and stories. Um, and when I moved to the border, uh, I think I kind of found a new part of myself in the songwriting process because I was so immersed in the feelings of others that I was just kind of absorbing, you know, at the soup kitchen, the great thing about being somebody really unimportant in an organization is that nobody really cares what you're doing. And so I spent a lot of time just sitting with people at the soup kitchen and eating, you know, the rest of the time I might be running around taking somebody to the doctor or taking somebody down to the port of entry. But most of the time I was really sitting at the soup kitchen eating and talking to people. And so people, you know, they, they started sharing their stories. They started sharing their lives with me. And, and I think with Hernandez, he was the first man. I took his story and I wrote a song and I came back to him and I said, well, I wrote the song. Do you want to hear it? And he said, yes. And I think he was so moved to see his own life through the lens of somebody else. And I, and I think this is this art has this redemptive power in the sense that it doesn't, it doesn't cure the problem, but it makes it not seem meaningless. You know, I think it gives all of our pain meaning again. And so to see how these men and women felt like touched by hearing this, their stories motivated me to continue doing this. So I would say, you know, I really just sit and listen to people. And then when I write a song, it's mostly spontaneous because I feel like if I'm thinking about it too much, it's just me. And it just, you know, I'm getting too much in the way of the process. So most of what I write is really 
you know, I read it in like five minutes and, um, and I, and I share it with the person that originated the song and, and, you know, one of the things that we did also on the border is that we started recording these interviews because since there was no really legal pathway to, to help these families get back into the U.S., what young people start doing is that they just start to push people into the U.S., assuming they would go into immigration detention and then make a sort of media campaign around their reality to get pressure to get them out. So I thought maybe if, if we write these, we record these interviews and we did this with other parents and we write these songs, they, they could get a little more attention. We could get some support for them. And that, well, actually that did work on one of the stories, <laughs> not for Mr. Hernandez, but, um, but that was kind of the other, the other side is we were hoping that it would be useful to them. Um, so Nakishi asks whether there is any way to have access to Angelica's interview. Is that is that yeah. available on your YouTube channel? Yeah, absolutely. It's on the, yeah, I think it is on the YouTube channel. It's also on my band camp for, for download. I'll send that to you, Anna. And then all of, there are about uh, four interviews that are overdubbed uh, and they're all free for download and, and listening. Great. Do you think you could tell us a little bit about the case where some, like the, you said, one of the songs had some kind of, or one of the stories had some kind of like positive outcome for like, or is that what you, you were just saying? Uh, well, with, yes, with Isabel Martinez, her story is on YouTube too. I was hoping we might listen to her story, but we didn't. Uh, Isabel Martinez was a, a lovely woman from Chicago that was deported. She had a young, a young daughter. She tried to cross seven times. Uh, and uh, on her seventh time, she tried to smuggle in through with the trains, which is hard because there's a lot of inspection on the trains that cross in and out of the border. But she managed to cross in one of these trains and she was taken down from the train as soon as she crossed the border and then she was chained to a fence. And, um, and so her story, you know, it's like, you listen to, to Isabel when she was deported the seventh time, we, we rounded her up and sent her to Tijuana because there was a young group called the National Immigrant Youth Alliance. And uh, they, they basically just got everybody together and they pushed them through the border and tried to pair people up with lawyers and media attention in hopes that people would get released. And Isabel was one of those cases. She, uh, she walked in through Tijuana and she was detained and she, I think through the lawyer and the media support, she actually made it back to, to Chicago. And as far as I know, she's still in Chicago with her daughter. <laughs> That's great. Um, so I, uh, I know we're getting to the end of our time. I don't think, I don't think there's a hard and fast deadline at five, but um, I just wanna see if anybody else has any more questions for Natalia before we before we finish up i have a quick one oh hello daniel Hola, Natika, ¿cómo estás? Um, i'm just curious why you think the discussion surrounding um central american migration is so different than the rest of the the world and, and conversely american migration to other places in the world um obviously expats versus migrants is is something that uh, you know, Colombia has plenty of at this point, too. Yeah. So uh, Daniel wanted to be in on the conversation. Daniel is my brother. <laughs> um, and also my tech guru. So uh, I don't think, I don't think it's, it's different. You know, this set really talks about the experiences of Mexicans and the history of Mexico. I think the story of Mexico and the U.S. is very different to the story of it's not entirely different to the story of Latin America because the U.S. has had its hand in all of Latin America, but Mexico and the U.S. really has been tied to the stomach for so long, starting by the fact that, you know, 70% of Mexico was the U.S. So I think that the, the pattern of migration of these families is different because they've been there forever and there is a culture that has been traveling to the U.S. forever for work, right? I mean, since the Braceros where the U.S. asked Mexicans to come into the U.S. The stories of Central Americans, um, I think it's a little different in the sense that 
most Central Americans are moving out of Central America because there is a mix of factors which have to do with like insecurity and also the beginning effects of climate change where, where people just cannot make a livelihood anymore and they're in places that are very unsafe. And it's not men that are leaving. You know, for Mexicans in the US, it was men that left Mexico and went to the US seasonally to work and come back, which became impossible as the, as the border grew. But these folks, they want to get out of Central America and they're not going back there. And it's not the men that are leaving. It's a lot of these women and, and young kids. And, you know, migration, I would say, you know, it's not that, that different in the sense that you can be like an American somewhere else, but what's different are how we, how we decide who gets to have residency or status or not. And that's still tied to how wealthy you are basically, you know? To those that have the wealth, they have a path to residency and citizenship. And to those that don't, they become second class citizens in the world that we live in. And I think that's the greater conversation that's gonna start to come up is like, you know, are we starting again in this system of first and second class citizens where citizens have certain rights and those that are not citizens don't have those rights? So. <laughs> okay, thanks for that. Okay, last call. Any, any last questions? I just really wanted to ask, you know, I know most of this has been about our, about the music and, and stuff. Are you still making music? Are you still writing songs um, about the border? Are you writing about other things now or sort of where are you in your... Yeah. Kind of so um, when I moved to Hermosillo, um, I, I was, I felt, uh, I would say, called or interested to look at the reality I was living in. Because so much of those three years I was on the borders, like there was nobody else in my life or in my world that was not like a deported Mexican, you know? That was my life was folks deported on the border. And so as I left the border, I really, I think I felt a need to like become part of a community and believe that you can that you can change the world in the community you're in. And so that made me open my eyes and say, well, who's in my community? Anybody that's in my community is, is interesting to me. And here in Hermosillo, we're a very agricultural state. So I started to become interested in agricultural farm workers, which also get tied into migration and deportation. And I became interested with the folks that are on the street, because we have a lot of crystal meth use on the street. And this is also tied into migration, because these men come from the agricultural fields. Um, and I, so I would say that I've, and then, you know, here in my home, we have Central American refugees. So I've been thinking more about like the experiences of those that have left their home as refugees, which is different, you know, and the, from migrants that get to plan where they're going or have kind of a plan, you know, refugees, they just, they pick up one day and they get whatever they can and they walk out the door running because there's no time to plan. So. So I think, you know, I've just become more open and, and interested in, in anything and everyone that's around me. <laughs> and I, yeah, I'm still writing songs. Yeah. I, I, may, I become sad if I don't, <laughs> if I don't write. And, um, and there's a, a thank you in the, in the chat. Thank you for sharing your stories and your songs. Um, oh, no, no, my pleasure. Um, and, uh, so I think I think I'm going to wrap it up. Um, oh, there's there's actually a question for you from Aliyah. Uh, was your family ever scared for you when you were out traveling? They didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. no, I I decided I wouldn't tell them anything until I was fine and safe. <laughs> I'm here because I I learn more about her every time. The people just joining. There's like little tidbits of stories that get told, but but. Yeah. You know, that's always a very filtered view. Yeah, yeah. It's best to keep your family out of too much information. You don't want to worry them. Yeah. <laughs> Luckily, my children don't hear you saying that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think I am going to wrap it up just, you know, I, as we talked about, we wanted to keep, you know, the length short because it's on Zoom. Um, but I feel like I could listen to your songs forever. Um, they're, they're really amazing. And everyone, I will send out to you the, um, 
the links to the, the I, I know your stuff is on YouTube, but I think it's also on iTunes music, right? Um, and it, it really is really incredible. So um, I will make sure everyone gets those those links. And thank you so much for, for joining us here today. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Anna, and all of you students. And please, if there is any uh, if there's any other information or questions you have about the border or any of the material that I already have that could be useful to you, please use it. And also um, feel free to send me an email if there's anything that, that just might come up and you wanted to ask. Okay. Well, thank you. You're getting lots of thank yous in the chat as well. <laughs> so thank you so much. Yes, yes. Everyone. <laughs> and have a wonderful, um, have a wonderful weekend. And uh, and stay warm and safe, everyone. And you stay cool in in downtown. <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye.